Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. We have an exciting show like we always do here on the Dean Show with a brother who went from being a Pentecostal Christian to the Zulu nation. What's the Zulu nation? We're going to find out about that. He went to Medina to study and he came back right after 9-11 and we're going to get his thoughts on that and we're going to get his thoughts on why he accepted Islam. We're going to ask him some tough questions here on the Dean Show with... Our brother, Wesley LeBron, his story here on The Dean Show. Be here with us. Don't go nowhere to hear this incredible story. We'll be right back. Here on The Dean Show, we're back with Wesley LeBron. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Peace be with you. And peace be with you. How are you? Alhamdulillah, everything is good. All praise and mercy. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, you found the time to be with us here on The Dean Show. You have an incredible story. You accepted the way of life of all the messengers of God, that complete submission to the will of the one creator who created you, me, this whole universe and everything in it. Yes. But before that, you were in the Zulu nation, Pentecostal, part of Christianity, you know, hanging with the homeboys. Yep. And you even went to Medina for a little bit to study. And now you're here on the Dean Show. Where do yeah. we start? <laughs> we can start uh, before Islam, briefly. Uh, Talk to us. You know, before Islam, um, I was raised Pentecostal in a Pentecostal family, um, very religious family. Um, raised by my grandmother because um, my father was an immigrant to this country. Um, in my teens, I started to pull away from religion. Um, I started to think about Jesus Christ and him being a man and walking on the earth, and I had a problem with worshiping him. So I started worshiping God. And then, of course, uh, being in middle school and high school, got involved with friends and partying and then started selling drugs and being out in the street and hanging out. So religion just completely left my mind altogether until... My mother, she used to raise foster children, and this one uh, kid that was, came up in our home named Edgar, um, his mother had died of AIDS, his father was in jail for most of his life, he was 17 years old, he introduced me to the Zulu Nation in New York. He said, look, there's this organization, the Zulu Nation, I would like to take you up there so that you can go ahead and get to see what it's about. And Africa Mambada, who was big in hip-hop, he was the leader, and he was the one that used to give the meetings. So we decided to go up with uh, him to New York, and when we went up to New York, we sat there and we was listening to the meetings. A lot of the meetings basically dealt with government conspiracies and things of this nature. They had principles, but uh, they were a gang in reality. Um, part of that was that a gentleman named Aziz, a Muslim brother, who was also Puerto Rican like myself and Edgar, he came and he said, can I talk to you brothers, after giving a short speech to all of the members of the Zulu Nation. And we said, sure. Edgar knew him from years back when he was with the organization or the gang. And he said, look, I would like to talk to you about Allah. He said, would you mind taking me home? So I told him, fine, let's go, I'll take you home. So he lived in the Bronx. So he, we went to his house, he invited himself for some coffee and some tea. And he began to talk to us about Allah, the one God. And he began to tell us that Allah didn't have a father, Allah didn't have a son, that Allah didn't have any family members, that he was the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that existed. And I said, man, I said, in my teens, this is what I believed in. I couldn't pray to Jesus because I had a problem praying to a man. And when I looked at the scriptures, it just didn't all... Uh, fall into line for, for me. So I said, do you have some more information about this? So he gave me a book, Tawheed, by Bilal Phillips. What does this mean, Tawheed? Tawheed basically means the oneness of God. I know what it means, just for, yeah. our, for our audience. Tawheed okay. basically means the oneness of God, praying and worshipping the one God, the one true creator, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who is free from association. No one, he has no equals, no partners. As he says in the Quran, Laysa Kamesli Hishay, Wahu Samir al Basir, there's nothing like an unto him. So I took this book on Tawheed, me, Edgar, and another friend of mine, and we would sit down, and we'd have lessons in reading this book. And we started to delve more into it. And at the same time, we started to read up on the Nation of Islam. And then we started to read up on the Five Percenters. Then we started to read a book called From Niggas to Gods. So we started to read all these... A, yeah, I mean, that, that's... You it know, was an actual book. A book. This is, not, this is a book called that name. This is a book, actually, From Niggas to Gods, that a particular type of Five Percenters used to study. So a religion is based on this book? What, or they study following, this book? A following studies this particular book. The five percenters, book. they yeah. follow this book, that the name you just Whether mentioned. Whether they follow the book or not, I'm not sure. I didn't really get too much into the depth of it. We had picked it up and we started to read all these books because we wanted to compare. Um, and when we started to compare, I said, before I can accept anything, I have to give Christianity a chance. This is the faith that my family came from. This is what I was raised in. I was raised Pentecostal. So I have to give it a chance. So I read the Bible from cover to cover. Upon reading the Bible from cover to cover, I had my highlight in my hand and I would highlight all the verses that I found to be problematic for me. And then I would go to the church and I would basically ask the pastor at the church, what about this verse? What about that verse? What about this verse? 
and all of the answers they were never satisfactory. So you sincerely you went up to the higher ups, the yes. the priests or whoever the uh, higher clergy in the church, and you were like. Talk to me. Yes. This is not making sense. And yes. you're asking them and uh, t have, wanting these sincere answers, and they couldn't. You couldn't give me answers. It wouldn't give you rest for your for your for your soul. My soul, my soul didn't find rest. No. And I would ask my grandmother as well because she was very religious. Um, I would ask my aunt who was. What also were some of the religious. questions you would ask? Um, basically, the monumental questions was: You say Jesus is God. There was verses in the Bible where he says, "Oh goodness," and he says, "Why thou call me good when thy only one good is thy one in heaven." I said he always referred back to God. He's always referring back to God. He prayed. He, he went into the garden. He bowed and prostrated his face into the ground, and he prayed to God. He did, didn't he? He did. That's in a, I believe that's uh, in uh, Matthew twenty six thirty nine that he fell on his face and he prayed to God. Unto the one God. Yeah. And then also the biggest one for me was when I sat down in the church and the pastor said that Jesus is the one and only true God. So after that, I approached him. I said, can I ask you a question? I said, Jesus is the only one and true God. I said, but when he was supposedly on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I said, so you have the God whom Jesus was crying to, and then you have your God that you're saying is Jesus. So which one who should I pray to? He looked at me confused, and he said, son, you just have to believe. I said, that's not a good answer for me. I said, a God has given us a mind. To tell me that I just have to believe and there's no proof, there's no evidence. Jesus is calling upon a God. You're telling me to call upon Jesus. I find it more comfortable to call upon the God that Jesus called upon. Makes sense. It makes total sense. So upon seeing those things and going to the church and asking those questions and continuing to read this book on Tawheed, we came to the final conclusion that, yes, we wanted to become Muslims. So we went back to New York to another meeting for Zulu Nation. And then we met with the brother Aziz and told him, look, we're interested in accepting Islam. And at that point, he actually showed us a movie called The Message about the Prophet Muhammad. May peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. We watched the movie, and it put more certainty in our heart. And then we became Muslims. We took shahada that night. What did you have to do to become Muslim? To become Muslim, we had to take the testimony of faith, basically. Say, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, which basically means, I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is the final messenger and prophet sent by Allah. I found this statement so profound because it, 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 if you connect it back to Jesus' time, Moses' time, Abraham's time, it was the same statement. Same There's same. no God but the one true God, nothing worthy of worship except the one true God. In yes. Arabic, we just say Allah. In Aramaic, Jesus said Allah. And Jesus was the messenger of God at that time, Moses at his time, Muhammad now at this time. Yep. That's the statement, right? Yep, that's the statement. The yeah. one universal message that he carried. And that's the message that we found to be universal within the Bible itself. And that's what gave us the conviction to become Muslim. So what goes on from there? From there, after that, you know, we still was dibbing and dabbing in this because we were new Muslims, so we didn't really know much, um, unfortunately. So we still partied, we're still drunk, unfortunately. Um, and Aziz, the brother, he came to us and had a talk one day. He said, listen, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have your cake and eat it you too. Now you want to accept the truth, but you're going to do opposite of the truth. It doesn't work. Exactly. He said, you can't come to the Zulu Nation meetings no more. You can't continue to go ahead and party, drink, and have fun and worship Allah at the same time. But what's this, you mentioned you accepted Islam, but the Zulu Nation, how does this fit in? Well, the Zulu Nation, what happened was, alhamdulillah, all praises to Allah, we didn't get to stay long with that gang, the Zulu Nation. It was a short period. But when, when we accepted, we didn't know if we wanted to leave it still, because they talked about a lot of government conspiracies, and it drew our interest. But and then when Aziz said, listen, you know, you can't have both. You're either going to be religious or you're going to deal with this junk over here. Because at the end of the day, it was a gang, and the underlining principles were no good. So we said to ourselves, okay, we're going to choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to choose to be religious. And he told us, don't come back to New York anymore. He said, find a mosque in your area, because we're from New Jersey originally. He said, find a mosque in your area. When you go there, call me. Let me know what they're teaching. And then I'll tell you if what they're teaching is correct. And then stay there at that place. Don't come up here no more and change. Mm -hmm. So we did that. We went to uh, Patterson, New Jersey. We found the mosque. We stood out in the parking lot. And we were kind of nervous at first. We was like, man, this is something new. We left. We didn't go in. We came back the second time. We said, okay, let's go in. So we went in the mosque. It was actually a Palestinian masjid. When we walked in, everybody's speaking Arabic. No English. Everybody's talking words. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you. Jazakallah khair. May Allah reward you. All these words. And we're sitting there, you know, astonished because... We didn't know what these words meant. We're going we're gonna to get into some of the definition of these word, common use words that you've heard, and we got so much more 
to talk about here on the Dean Show with our brother, your brother, Abdul Sumeya, here on the Dean Show. We'll be right back. Back here on the Dean Show with Abu Sumeya, formerly Wes, uh, Wesley LeBron. Yes, correct. What, like Wesley Snipes? Like Wesley Snipes and like LeBron James. Yeah, so <laughs> why did you change your name? Well, when we first accepted Islam, you know, um, it was a big thing. I, I walked in and met Muslims and everybody has these different names and we started to find out what they mean. So a good friend of mine who accepted Islam with me, Tony, um, he said, we started looking at the attributes of Allah. Mm -hmm. So one of the attributes was Abdul Razak, which meant the provider, of the, the servant of the provider, meaning Allah. So he said, you have kids. You're always providing for your kids. You're always taking care of people. You're always helping people out. Why don't you take this on as an attribute for yourself? And that way is a constant reminder for you of what you should be doing. So I said, wow, that's great. I said, yeah, definitely. So I took on the name of Razak at that point. And then they called me Abu Sumeya, which basically means the father of Sumeya. So my youngest daughter, her name is Sumeya. Your, your daughter is Sumeya, Abu Sumeya. So our uh, you know, uh, viewers who are not Muslim, they can have yeah. a better understanding. Exactly. So there's meaning behind these names. Definitely. Yeah. There's definitely meaning. Okay, so tell us now, continue on. Let's just go back real quick, the Zulu nation. But, so they had some, some, they took some of the teachings of Islam, but technically, do they have anything to do? Are they, uh, what do they have? This is not a sect, I mean, this is this a sect of Islam? What are they? No, what happened was African Mambara, he came into Islam, but he thought Islam was nationalism. Uh -huh. But when he found out that it wasn't nationalism, then he wanted, he made his own form of concoction. I don't even know what you want to call it because when you used to go to the meetings, basically, he would allow different people from different faiths to stand up and pray. And after those, all those prayers went on, and then he would get to the meeting at hand, would be to talk about the government conspiracies. And he was a big follower of Dr. York, which I'm not sure if you're familiar no. with Dr. York. Dr. York was basically someone who started Ansarullah. That's how he started in New York. And they started out as Muslims, and then they changed to be Jews. And then they changed to be cowboys, I think it was. And then now they, then they changed to be Egyptians. And he actually built like pyramids in, uh, I think it's Alabama, I think it is, um, or somewhere out there, it's down south. And he had his own teachings. He said that he was a prophet. He said he was the Mahdi. Basically, he was saying that he was the one whom you had to follow, basically. So this is basically like Zulu Nation, Nation, and all these other uh, people who are trying to be under the umbrella of Islam. They have nothing. This is nothing to do. They have nothing to do with Islam. Nothing to do. Islam, with Islam is Islam. Islam is Islam. Okay. So continue on with your story. You know, you go from um, Pentecostal Christian. It's not making sense to worship a man. You want to worship the one who created Jesus, the one who Jesus prayed to. So then you get hooked up with the Zulu Nation. You, you end up, they end up sending you to a, a mosque in your area, New York. What happens from there? So basically from there, I went into the mosque, you know, and like I said, they I walked in and these people were using all these different terms in Arabic. Uh, the imam, the leader of the masjid, uh, he was talking in Arabic because uh, all of his constituents were basically Arabs. So I said, man, I made a mistake. I said, I came into this faith. I said, I don't speak Arabic. I don't understand what they're saying. You're like, I don't, I'm Puerto Rican. I don't I, want to be Arab. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it just so happened that when we came out of the mosque that day and walked into the hallway, we seen two guys in the hallway. They had hoods, sweat hoods on. They looked like they were from the hood. So I said, hold on. I said, let me go talk to them. You know, it looks like I could go ahead and get along with these guys. These are, they come from where I come from. So when I went up to them, they were actually from Guatemala, two brothers from Guatemala who accepted Islam maybe a few years before we did. So they told us, look, there's an American mosque about a mile from here. You may be, feel more comfortable if you go there. So I said, okay. He gave us the address, and we decided to go there. But before we went there, we actually took some time. Because, like I said, we were still involved in the street, and it was, this was a little much for me. Was, the walking the step was a little much. So one day, we picked up a friend from the projects, and I see two men walking, African-American men, and they had thobes on. What's the Arab cultural wear, the white long garment that looks like a dress. So I looked at him and I said, yo, I said, who, what's this? So my friend who accepted Islam with me, Tony, he said, those are Muslims. I said, I know I accepted the wrong faith now. I said, I can't walk around here wearing dresses. They're crazy. What's wrong with them? Yeah. I said, oh, man, this is crazy. So we decided, said, look, let's go to the American mosque in Patterson, the other one, and see, see what's going on. And lo and behold, when I walk in, the same man that I saw at the projects with the thobe and the white dress on, he was the imam there. Uh -huh. And it just so happened that we sat down and we began to talk to him, and that became a long, beautiful friendship that I had with that particular imam. So one day, it just so happened, I was at home drinking, smoking with friends, and we're sitting out on my porch. While we're sitting out on my porch, I'm looking into the sky. I'm just looking at the moon. I'm looking at the stars. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. And the story of Ibrahim, I had read it in the Quran just recently about him talking to his people, talking about the sun 
must be my Lord. Look at how strong it is. And when the night covered the day, he said, must, it, it, that can't be my Lord because verily is weak. So I start contemplating on this story. And I said, if I don't change, Allah is going to destroy me. At that moment, I told my friends, get up, get out of my house. They said, what are you talking about? You drink, you get high, now you don't know how to act? I said, no, this is the first time in my life that I know exactly what I'm doing. I said, get up and leave. At that point, I knew that I had to cut off all of my friends. This was in the middle of the party now. This was in the middle of a, of a, of a gathering. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, you got to go. Uh-huh. I said, Were they Muslim? They weren't Muslims. Okay. I was hanging around with a bunch of non-Muslims. And I said, you got to go. But they weren't good influencers for you now. They weren't they're good still, they're, they're supporting the drinking, the do- smoking. and Calling me to it. Know. Yeah. Calling me to it. And, and, and that's why I said, I have to cut them off. And you really want to become a better human being. And I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to be a better man. I wanted to be a better father. I wanted to be a better worshiper to my creator. So I knew that I had to get away from them. So I cut them off. I left them alone. And I, the home, my second home became the masjid. I would go to work, come out of work, and go to the mosque. And I would stay in the mosque, learning, praying, sitting around the brothers so that I can go ahead and begin to develop better character. And this, began, this became my life. Tell us now, you took a major step, a major leap forward. But why? Why not just stay where you're at, hanging out? It's fun. People, you know, drinking with the boys, chasing the ladies, you know, going to the parties, to the nightclubs. Mm-hmm. Now you have all a bunch of do's and don'ts. Yeah. You got to get up at a certain time and pray yeah. when it's difficult to get up. You can't, you, you're not supposed to be cursing, lying, deceiving. You know, uh, over here, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty easy lifestyle. This, it, it takes a lot of effort, you know what yes. I mean? It's a struggle. Why didn't you just stay with the easy way? Why did you choose this hard way? Well, the easy way, it seems easy, but it's actually miserable. You live in this life that it seems to be something that seems to be all about fun and partying. But the reality is, is that there's no fun. It's, after it's all over, you woke up, you had a hangover. You may have got a woman pregnant like I did two times, ended up having two kids. Now you got child support, you know, it has consequences with it. And then when I began to live the life of faith, it began to become sweet. 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 Life began to taste so sweet. Faith began to taste sweet. I began to feel like a person all over again. I began to feel free. When I worshiped God, I was able to worship him with peace in my heart. I was able to walk around and show my family. My family, when they saw the change in me, it was incredible. At first, they didn't want to know nothing about me. You're a Muslim, get out of here. You're worshiping the devil. And then when they seen that I stopped drinking, that I stopped smoking, that I changed my life, I stopped womanizing. And then they came to me and said, hold on, let's sit down. What this is not the same guy. <laughs> this is not the same guy. We've been trying to get him to stop the whole time. It didn't work. Nothing didn't, worked. Nothing worked. But Islam worked. Islam worked. Why? So much so that my father, one time he was at a hot dog truck and the man was praying. And when the man finished praying... He said to my father, I'm sorry, I'm Muslim. My father said, no, my son is Muslim, I understand. He said, where are you from? He said, Puerto Rico. He said, and your son's Muslim? He said, what do you think about Islam? He said, I can sleep at night now. <laughs> your father could, you caused so much havoc. Yes. Your father couldn't, and mother couldn't sleep. But now you accepted Islam, the worship of the one creator. And now your character got better, your life got better. And now your parents could finally get some rest. <laughs> yes, my family could finally get some rest were, and they were at peace. Were they worried now also because, you know, all the false hype that's out there that now you're going to, you know, go and hurt innocent people, terrorize people. What about that? Well, what's amazing was that when the hype kicked in, I was actually in Medina studying. So you actually went down to the Islamic University of Medina. This is how motivated you are. You went, went to the university, yes. the pre- prestigious university to learn the religion. What yes. happened? I went to the prestigious University of Medina and learned the religion. And I always say that, my, that Allah did not send me there to, to learn. He didn't send me there so that I could become a scholar. He sent me there to change my life. When I went there, I saw what worship was all about. It became clear to me that God is to be surrounded, that our life is to be surrounded around God and not God around our lives. So I was there for about six months. 9-11 happened and my family was here in the States. So I felt that I had to come back because me and my wife were the only Muslims in our family. And I felt that she needed the support being a new Muslim that I needed to give her. And we needed to support each other in this particular time. And at the same time, I needed to be here to also talk to my family and prove to my family that, listen, this is not what Islam and what Muslims are all about. We're going to take a break. we got a few more questions to ask before we come to a close here on The Dean Show. You don't want to go nowhere with this exciting story. We'll be right back. Back here on The Dean Show with our brother and your brother, Abu Sameya, talk to us now. A few more minutes left. I want to ask you some tough questions. 
for the people now that are watching, the not yet Muslims, because everyone has the potential to submit to only God, the one God, the God that now you were searching for, you didn't want to worship a man, you didn't want to worship Jesus. By, by, by the way, are you like anti-Christ now? No, I'm not. Basically, I'm for Christ. If we don't believe in Christ, we don't believe. That's what our prophet taught us. So we love Christ just like we love Muhammad. We love Christ more than, more than the Christians do. Well, I, that's a bold statement. How, uh, can you back that up? Oh, of course, definitely. You know, part of Christ is in our life as well. You know, many, Muslim, many people think that we don't believe in Christ. That was the first thing my family thought. And then we start to show them the proof. There's a whole chapter about Mary in the Quran, chapter 19. If you read it, it speaks about Mary and about all the things that Mary went through. It speaks about Jesus, all the miracles that Jesus had, all the miracles that Jesus did, everything that Jesus taught. So when we look at it, and they're more detailed than what was in the Bible. I was able to talk to my family about some of the miracles. They never heard none of these things. Mm -hmm. They were surprised. Mm -hmm. so, so definitely we show our love for Jesus. We definitely show our love. And, and someone might say, oh, oh he, he went radical on us now. What would you have to say? <laughs> no way. Basically, Islam is a religion of peace. It's a religion of mercy. It's a religion of submission. It's a religion of being at peace with humanity. You want humanity to have that peace. Our religion doesn't teach us to kill people. Our religion doesn't teach us to terrorize people. Rather, our religion teaches us, like the Prophet told us, if you, the, the, the best Muslim is the one who's good to his neighbor that you should bring over some soup to your neighbor, you should get to meet your neighbor, you should get to know who your neighbors are. Me and my neighbor, they tell me where their key is hidden for their home. If I'm not home, they tell me, you can come into my house, check on my house for me. This is what neighbors are supposed to be. This is what Islam is supposed to do. That you're supposed to be around in the society and the people are supposed to be feel peace and tranquil with you. So how did you feel when 9-11 happened? When 9-11 happened, I was upset, naturally, because they blamed the Muslims. And of course, my family, at first, they were like, we're fighting the enemies. And I'm like, hold on. <laughs> I'm a Muslim, so am I the, am I the enemy now? And my mother was like, uh, hold on. No. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was baffling, you know. So we had to come and teach them, no, this is not what our prophet taught us. Our prophet told us that the man who kills himself, kills himself in a suicide bombing, that he goes to hell. There's no permission. In times of war, we can't kill innocent women and children. You can only fight the person who's fighting you. You can't bulldoze homes. You can't tear the trees out of the front of the homes. You can't do none of these things. So if the person, and if the person you're fighting stops, then you're supposed to stop as well, which, to show that self-restraint. So this is what Islam teaches us. Amazing, amazing. Uh, tell us now, for the person who's still stuck where you were, and you know they're not happy. That void is there. There's an emptiness there, and they're still partying, hanging out at the nightclubs, you know, womanizing, and the women getting sucked up also, wanting the attention for the, from the men, and, you know, it becomes just a game, a never-ending cycle. And what, 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 how would you advise them? My advice for them is basically take the chance, read about Islam, read about the Qur'an, read about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, give yourself a shot. You deserve better as a human being, as a person. You deserve more in your life than partying, drinking, being with men, being with men, women. Give yourself a shot. Pray to God. He's the one who created you. You're, we're living in this existence because of Him. We breathe every day because of Him. What you have is because of Him. He's the one who provided for you. So you have to go ahead and seek after Him. You have to find out who He is. Find out what he expects of you, and then fulfill that. Amazing. Tell us now. We're we're almost out. Of, we we got one minute left. You also are, are continuing also your education. You uh, are with the, what's the new name of the university? I'm with Mishkah University, which yeah. used to be the Sharia Academy of America. And basically, I found them in 2006 and continue studied uh, studying Islam. Um, about I have about 10 courses left for my BA in Islam, and. I think that for those who are looking to learn more about Islam, I think this is a good source for you. You're also the president of the Latino Muslims of Chicago? Yes, the president of the Latino Muslims of Chicago. We have monthly classes that we have at ICCI here in Chicago, um, the first Saturday of every month at 1 o'clock. First Saturday of every month? At 1 o'clock. And the lectures are all in Spanish yeah. because we want to reach out to the Latino community and be able to give back to them. Uh, how can people get a hold of you if they wanted more information on, on the Latino Muslims in Chicago or Islam in general? Islam, Latino Muslims, Latino Muslims Chicago at gmail.com. 
Okay, but they don't have to be Latino. Maybe they want to talk. They can relate to you. They, you know, have been through, you know, some of the things that you've been through. And you know what? It's late at night, early in the morning. They're like, man, I need to change my life. I can identify with this yes. guy. I need to talk with him. Yeah. So they can reach you there? You can reach me there. You can hit me up on Facebook, Abu Sumeya LeBron at Facebook. And you can send me a friend, and I'll friend you, and we can sit and talk. If people invited you to come out to their town, to their city, also to do, you know, a talk about, you know, extend a talk about your story, you'd be willing to come? Oh, definitely. More, <laughs> more, more than willing. More All right. Willing. May Allah, the creator of the heavens and earth, reward you immensely for sharing your story with us. And may he bless you, Akhi, for all the good work that you do, Akhi. Ameen. Thank you. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum And that was another exciting episode. I'm sorry we had to come to an end. I know you'd want us to continue more. It was very exciting, and I hope that you got the benefit. And if you're tuning in for the first time, know that we're here every week. We're here helping you develop a clear, lucid understanding about the way of life that was sent for all of mankind to live by. Peace acquired by submitting your will to the one who created you. That's Islam. That's the message that was sent throughout time. Really understand that we're not self-sufficient that there is a purpose in life and we need to live our purpose. That that void that's inside all of us cannot be filled with drinking and partying and just going out there and living according to your whims and desires. That will never make you happy. But when you truly surrender yourself to the one who created you, you have a, a relationship with the one who created you. His way, not your way. That's how you can truly be successful when you live your purpose according to God's will, not your desires. And it starts with asking, and when you ask, you shall receive. So ask the Creator to guide you, and He'll facilitate a way. He'll facilitate a way, God willing. Continue to tune in here to the Dean Show. We're here to help you. You can call us at 1-800-662-ISLAM to learn more. And we'll see you next time. Peace be unto you.